a lot of my friends were like, oh man, you know, you, you, you sold millions of records. You're not going to have any problem. Just tell these rappers you want to make beats. I'm like, yeah, dude, it's not that easy. Why would they want to beat from like a 37 year old guitar player in a rock band when they could have, you know, some like 20 year old kid who's out there with like the next sound. I got to find how do I compete with, with someone like that? Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne, one for BeatStars.com. Uh, in the building, aka Skype, uh, live with Billy Martin. Uh, you might know him from the iconic band Good Charlotte. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing well. And actually, at first, when I heard um, you were releasing beats, I thought to myself, Billy Martin makes beats? And, and it's making more sense to me now as I, I kind of think about it. But first things first, how long have you been making beats? Um, I mean, I've always been messing with electronic music. Uh, even like early Good Charlotte records, I did a lot of programming and keyboards and stuff. But as far as like making beats, Good Charlotte took a break in around 2012. We kind of just went on hiatus for about four years. And in that, right around 2012, I thought, okay, well, I don't have a band anymore. And I still want to make music. So let's try to do this whole like beat thing and take it seriously. So probably around 2012 was when I really got serious about um, making beats. Okay, so important question now. What are your beat making weapons of choice? I use Ableton Live. I love Ableton. Um, back in the day, I used Pro Tools when I first started demoing, but in... Like when I said in 2012, I kind of wanted to start fresh with like a whole new thing. So I thought, let's learn a new program. Let's get some new gear and just just try to get inspired. So um, I picked Ableton um, and I use uh, I use like a Universal Audio Apollo. That's like my interface. Um, I love that. As far as you know, plugins go. I love Native Instruments. I love Output. Um, both of those companies, I think, make really, really um, good sounds. There did seem to be a lot of respect for hip hop among the the original members of Good Charlotte, and I read something about the, this Beastie Boys origin story. But without getting into that, listening back on some of those records, like the anthem, the intro of the anthem, there's there's this hip hop beat at the beginning, and then the bridge in um in, in Girls and Boys was this this quite obviously hip hop beat. And and you mentioned that you did some programming. Were you a part of that? And and then what made the the band add those parts to the song? Uh yeah, like the the intro the intro to the anthem is something I did. That's like a, a gated effect on the guitar, just to kind of give it that bounce with a little program drum in there. Um, but really, like we grew up in Maryland, like right in between. I grew up right in between Baltimore and DC, and um, hip hop just sort of dominates those cities as far as music goes. I mean, sure there was a rock scene, we were a part of it, but all the kids I grew up with at school listen to hip hop. All the radio stations were hip hop. Um, that's just sort of part of, I guess, just where we grew up um, culture wise. Everybody in the band loves hip hop. And like you said, you listen to the first Good Charlotte record all the way through to the newest one. There's always been influence. You, you hear it in all the songs, whether it's lyrically or musically. It's always something we've tried to incorporate just because we love it. Um, and then you know, I'm just a fan of music in general, so I like what I like, and I don't like what I don't like, and um, yeah, so you just, that's the cool part of being in a band, is you kind of got to pull from all these different places and, and see what comes out. So during the first couple Good Charlotte releases, were you ever trying to, to, to slide beats to rappers you run into on tours or at labels? Was that ever something that you tried to do? I wasn't confident enough with my beats back then. Back then, it was kind of just you know, we would always have like a really dope producer that we were doing Good Charlotte's records with. So I could take like just a simple program beat or something and say, hey, here's this idea. And, you know, the producer would take it, make it sound awesome. And, you know, I'd be like, man, I wish I could do that. When we first signed our record deal, I was 17. I was still a senior in high school. So I was young. I didn't I wasn't really smart. I knew how to play guitar. That was it. So looking back on it, I think about all these cool opportunities I was at it, you know, with MTV awards and festivals and stuff around all these rappers and thinking, man, if only, if only I knew what I knew now back then, I probably could have had some cool opportunities, but now I kind of, kind of missed out on that in the early days. So now, now I'm trying to make up for it. So, um, I'm not going to dwell too much on, on the good Charlotte, um, projects, but they're significant. I mean, you had some really commercially successful albums for So for example, the, the most successful release i believe went three times platinum it might have gone more but what comes with you know a lot of people watching this have no concept of what that that means in, in, in practical terms so what comes with having a three time platinum album in terms of opportunity revenue streams that kind of thing going platinum i think that's every artist's um kind of goal that it feels really good to to have that as part of your history uh for me 
I really think people always ask me what's your proudest moment or, or what, what's like something that you look back on. And for me, like it's longevity because I've seen so many artists come and get that platinum record and that's it. They hit platinum once and, and it's like they peaked and, and they're gone. You know, you, you never see from them again. So uh, for me, I'm thankful that 20 years later, you know, like a- after that four year break of, of Good Child taking a break, we're back and, and making new records and touring. And, and, you know, I feel like our numbers are 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 really strong for a band who's been together for a long time but i think like just simply like, um, when you read a review for a new record it'll mention this band you know has sold 11 million records worldwide or something and that's a cool number you know it's hard to say these days that you sold a, a, um 11 million records in your career let alone 1 million it's hard to go platinum so revenue stream sure but you know back in the day on on major labels it was a little bit easier to make money um recouping was a big part of it it was you know expensive to make a record labels were putting a ton of money into studio time and producers and you had to recoup you had to sell enough records to to pay the label back before you started making money but if you go three times platinum you're paying the you've recouped and you're gonna make money by then so that, that was definitely cool to see um to see money come because nowadays it's like you make a record just as like free promo to go on tour like i don't even think about revenue from album sales sure like concerts publishing you know stuff like that you, you see money from but actual album sales like it's something that, that i don't even really think about anymore which is sad to think that's where we're at but i'm happy to, to have come to this industry where i've kind of seen how it was and now figuring out like where we as a band or me as a as an artist sit in in today's culture because it's two totally different things. I think it's interesting too now to compare the game, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago now where it is a lot more difficult to make money especially if you're if you're on a major or if that's your goal to get signed to a major cuz majors are looking for the the bands and the artists that are already fully produced, already ready, they just have to <laughs> you know stick a battery in their back and, and and that's it minimal investment minimal development but there are also a lot more revenue streams available to musicians because of the internet because of streaming because of all these um, new platforms that are emerging so uh, what are what are some of the the new ones that you're seeing as viable and and especially given the price point difference between say like a, a t-shirt or a band hoodie and a CD, it's a much higher price point. How are you taking advantage of, of that as you continue to be an active of member of this band? Uh, I mean, it's definitely harder to make money. Um, obviously, cool things like SoundCloud is a cool opportunity for young, up-and-coming artists to have that platform to put your music out and people are going to hear it and you can make money from it. I think that's a really cool thing. Um, like beat stars for, for, for example, is awesome. I, I've been trying to do this... Um, you know, producing thing for a couple of years and probably maybe like only like the last two years have I thought, okay, I'm going to take this really seriously and figure out how to get placements and how to not just make this a hobby, to, but make it like a legitimate thing where when Good Charlotte's not on tour and I'm home, you know, with my family, I can keep making music and keep making money. And um, I started just talking to a lot of other producers, young artists online, figuring out what are they doing. And a lot of my friends were like, oh man, you know, you, you, you sold millions of records. You're not going to have any problem. Just tell these rappers you want to make beats. I'm like, yeah, dude, it's not that easy. You know, like why would they want to beat from like a 37 year old guitar player in a rock band uh, when they could have, you know, some like 20 year old kid who's out there with like the next sound making really hot beats. And like, that's the dude I want. So I got to find how do I compete with, with someone like that? Where's my niche? Where, where do I find my place in this? And um, one of the guys who I, I, I came across online who we've been talking with is your boy Kato on the track. And Kato was really cool. Like, hey, man, here's what you should do. And started just like giving me the knowledge, like telling me all about this is 2019 selling beats. This is what you need to know. And he said, go check out BeatStars, set up a profile on there, um, get yourself in the mix and and. I think that's a big thing is just learn, learn what people are doing, learn, learn what's hot right now and, and figure out um, where you fit in because I can't have the same mentality of what it was like 10 or 15 years ago when things were where they're at with Good Charlotte because it's, it's a different day and age. It's a different industry. It's a different genre than what I'm used to. So um, I do think that the internet is, it's really, it's really powerful, but it's also like the, the playing fields have been leveled. Like someone on a major label and a kid in his basement making music, like, it's not that far off as far as getting your music out to people. What are some of your your, your goals for your BeatStars membership? I mean, right now, like I said, I'm really trying to find like my niche in the hip hop world. Where do I fit? Because um, there's so much good stuff out there. The talent is is insane with 
I guess just not how easy, but how like accessible laptops and programs and sounds are. Like it's it's a lot easier to throw together like a decent sounding beat. You got to have an ear for melody. Um, that's definitely something I hope can set me apart. Um, you know, I've been a professional musician for almost 20 years. Um, I mean, like I play guitar, I'm a guitar player. So something I just did recently, I made a guitar loop melody pack. So it's got like 20 guitar loops of just guitar progressions, leads, melodies, just a bunch of different guitar samples that are like looped in different BPMs at different keys. And I'm getting ready to drop that um, on BeatStar. So that's something I'm, I'm really excited about. And just like I said, just kind of thinking, what where can I fit into this world? So I'm going to start with guitar and a lot of uh, collabs. That's what I'm going to do, a lot of working with other producers, because you learn so much collabing with other guys, just seeing where their head's at, where their mindset's coming from, and they're all just like, man, play guitar. I need guitar. I want guitar stuff. So so that's where I'm at right now is, is uh, yeah, just trying to get some stuff out there and see where I fit. So we've, we've kind of touched on uh, the major label systems a couple times. You've released music through a few major labels and having navigated the major label landscape uh, quite a bit what would it, what advice would you give to any musician rapper producer songwriter etc for successfully navigating these systems you definitely got to find someone who believes in you like your a and r guy is important i think we have been pretty lucky especially early on finding an a and r guy who believed in our band and wanted to let us make the music that we wanted to make i think if you walk into a situation and the first thing the label says is hey we love what you're doing but we think it'd be better if you were doing this or we could see you doing this. And right off the bat that they're telling you that you, that you want to do something that you know is not you. That's probably like a, a red flag. Like that's not a good situation. You need someone who says, we love your music. We get what you're doing. We want you to keep doing you. And we want to find out how to make you, you know, on a bigger platform. So I think that's really key is finding someone who you work with, find to make sure you're protected, make sure you have a lawyer, you know, make sure you have a good contract. There's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, when we signed deals back in the day, you signed a record deal. That's it. The, the record label didn't touch anything from your merch, nothing from your concerts, nothing outside of the album. That was it. And there's so many deals nowadays that the label comes in and they get a piece of every single thing you do. And, and they're not out on the road, man. It's hard work on the road. You know, you're out there for months at a time. It beats you up. You're putting the time in. You're playing every single night. Your body's worn down. You're meeting fans all the time, and it's it's part of it. And and as musicians, you love that. But I don't think the label has really any right taking any of that money. They're not out there doing the work. So I really think you got to find the right deal, and you got to find the right people who are like a good fit with you. Good Charlotte recently released a new album through BMG, and BMG is somewhat of a branch off of of. Was it Sony? Yes. So they're kind of a major, but they're not technically a major. So how was that different from working with, say, Epic or, or Capital Records? Well, the cool thing with this, like when we were with on Epic or Capital, your A and R guys kind of like coming in the studio often and checking up on stuff and sort of giving their two cents on, hey, I've got this vision for this band's record. I want to make sure that the music you're you're creating like fits within this sort of template that that I envision. And sometimes that's great when you have the right A&R guy. Sometimes that can mess with your creativity because, you know, they're in there trying to give your their input and that's not what you like. Uh, but with this with this new record situation, we finished the whole record by ourselves, funded it ourselves, recorded it, you know, mixed, mastered, the whole thing was done. And then we took it to labels saying, hey, you know, we, we've got this record. We want to put it out. The previous record before that, we put out completely independent, just with a distributor, no label whatsoever. And that was a great experience. But you get a, you kind of need to put it to the next to push it to the next level. Like the promo that a label can give you is something that you can't really do independently. So we kind of thought, what's the best of both worlds? We do the record our own. We find someone, a label who's help, willing to put it out and get that label to back it but there's no creative input from the label. So that was sort of where we, we went with this record, and I think it's the happiest we've ever been with the whole process, um, start to finish, for sure. And, and that album, um, Generation RX, has a connection to hip-hop artist Lil Peep. Um, may he rest in peace. How strong is that connection? You know, unfortunately, I didn't get to meet Lil Peep. Um, Benji and Joel, the, the two singers in my band, um, had run into Peep out in L.A., and he was sort of telling them, hey, you know, Good Charlotte was my favorite band growing up. You guys were such a big influence on us. And they were texting me like, hey, man, you got to check out this kid, Little Peep. You know, he's sick. I, I think this is like the next wave. So we were actually planning a tour together. We were going to do a Good Charlotte, Little Peep tour. And, um, you know, I was thinking like, oh, that's really different for us, like taking a hip hop act out. But this kid's not really hip hop, but he is. And I mean, I, I love Peep. I mean, I think we all do. If he was still here, man, that 
another level. So we were really excited to see where that would go. And then I swear, like maybe two months after that, um, the news hit that Peep had passed. And, you know, we were all just shocked um, because there was so much promise there. And it was really excited to see what, you know, what it would have been like to tour together and see what it would have, um, where he would have gone. And so the first thing the guy said was, hey, we should cover one of his songs. You know, we should do something as just a tribute for him. And then his mom reached out and said, could you guys film it and do a video of it that we could play at his funeral? And we were on tour at the time. So um, we had just finished doing the cover before the tour. And then we had a video crew come out for Soundcheck one day and we, and we filmed like um, a video for it at, at Soundcheck to send to his funeral. So, yeah, man, um, it's it's certainly sad. It, it's awful to 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 hear that stuff and to think what could have happened would have been crazy. But um, I'm, I'm glad to, you know, that we were able to do something for him. This is, this is interesting to me. So you're a visual artist as well, and you've designed a lot of good Charlotte's artwork and you even published a, a book, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was Damius McDreary, a boy in his back. Yeah. yeah. It's like a children's book that I wrote and illustrated. Okay. How do you balance all of these creative pursuits, finding balance with just, one thing you know making music is is and living life and having a family and everything that's enough but you're in a band you're making beats you're you're a, you, you've published books you're an illustrator you're a graphic designer how do you do that I definitely you know it's probably stupid that i try to do all th- all of those things but i truly love them all it's i think when you're an artist you know you're you're creative too like there's those moments where like if a day or two goes by and i and i don't create anything like i'm grumpy like i'm i'm not in a good mood cuz i need to get it out so I, if for me it's more of a necessity than than anything cuz i just i need to to fill both the artistic and musical side of me i love both um but i, I kind of stay pretty regimented in my schedule i mean i am i have a wife and two kids so like family time is also key i mean i got to spend time with my family and try to find a way to to balance it out but when i go on tour um i don't really like i don't really party a lot like on tour for me that's kind of like work mode when i'm home i can relax and hang out with my family and friends and and when i go out on the road i usually wake up early you know i get up around like 9 9:30 in the morning and i spend the first chunk of my day working on illustration jobs um, I freelance for like Nickelodeon and for Marvel and stuff like that. So a lot of times those those companies will 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 hit me with a job when I'm on tour. So I spend the first chunk of the day working on on art jobs, and then later in the day, you know, we'll do a sound check for the show. We'll do a meet and greet. We'll do the concert, and then when the concert's over, you kind of like ramped up with energy and adrenaline from the show, and I can't go to sleep. So usually I go on the bus and I get out my music stuff, and then I work on beats for like a couple hours in the evening after the show and then just get up the next day and do it again. So similar kind of schedule at home, just regiment, make sure there's time for everything. And some days I might just work on music for a couple of days or some weeks be a couple of days of music, then a couple of days of art. Just just uh, kind of, that's the cool thing about freelancing and making beats is there's no nine to five. I don't have to check in and do this at this time every day. It's kind of which whichever job comes my way. Um, I just focus on that one and just try to be disciplined about it. Here's a question I get all the time and I don't always have a, a great answer for it how do you deal with creative block especially when you're involved in so many different creative pursuits i think that's another reason why i do do so many things because i think if you just do one creative outlet over and over again you're gonna hit that block more often so if i'm stuck on a beat maybe i put it away and i'm like all right i've got a drawing i know that's due let me work on this drawing for a little bit so bouncing between different creative mediums for me is a really great way um but also just inspiration man like i'm 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 obsessed with like what's current and what's new. Like I know a lot of people listen to the same stuff they grew up with and that's it. But I mean, I'm on like Apple Music or Spotify like every Friday looking what's new, what's hot, like always searching for new stuff and and just listening because I want to hear like where trends are going, what sounds are popular, like what's what's hot and why is it hot and researching and stuff. So I think as long as you're just always soaking up new stuff, I think that's the best way for creative block is is don't just get stuck in that same rut of listening to the same stuff and doing the same stuff. Like just branch out and and try different stuff, and you'll be surprised how often like one little thing in a song or something might hit you with a new idea. Okay, so speaking of your ideas, how do people browse your online beat catalog, and and then also how do they grab that new um, guitar sample library that you created? Yeah, so I got um, so B Stars hooked me up with a pro page, which is awesome. That's Billy Martin dot dot com is my pro page, and um, the the guitar pack is gonna be going up there next week. 
And um, I think I got about maybe 25 beats up there right now. Um, kind of just sift through some of my favorite stuff. I, I didn't want to put some older stuff up there, but I'm still digging through my hard drives, trying to fill up, put some more stuff up on there. But a lot of stuff I had been labeling sort of by like the sound or the vibe I got from it. But again, I'm trying to look and see what everybody else is doing and figure out what's hot right now. And everyone seems to be labeling their beats by what artist they would think sounds good over it. So I kind of went back and relabeled a lot of my beats um, with different artists who they, who they style. So, so that's a good way to look for stuff. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, a lot of people think it's the other way around that, that producers sit around and just try to copy what someone else is doing rather than kind of envision who would sound good on a track. And, and then that becomes a problematic conversation. So for you as, as a, an accomplished musician, as a producer, do you think it's good to have a vision of an artist or potential artist who you could hear on on music that you create yeah i don't think there's any rules i think whatever makes you happy and whatever you think works for you is what works for you um personally i don't think about that until the beat's done when i start working on a beat i just start working on it and i just whatever sounds cool sounds cool like whatever sounds i'm working or 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 whatever i'm definitely not like oh i'm gonna make a beat that i think so and so would sound like but when i'm uploading the songs to beat stars I'll, I'll play the song and listen to it for a second and think all right who could i hear over this or what does this beat remind me of but it's definitely not what i'm thinking about while i'm making the beat but i don't think i don't know man i, I think uh i think a lot of things are too overlooked and too many people are pointing fingers at oh you can't do this or you should do this or there's there's no rules in music man there really isn't and that's the best part you know so what can we look forward to in 2019 and 2020 from billy martin one of those things with hip hop, you know, you send beats out all the time. I have so many songs that I've that I've thrown out there with with guys that that I hope are coming out. Um, I've only had a couple, you know, real placements come out. Like I did one for Lil Xan's last record. That was like my first placement. It was a co-produced with my bro Morgoth. Um, he was definitely someone who kind of helped put me onto the scene and got this this song going with Lil Xan. And uh, that really sort of kicked it off for me. Getting that placement, I was thinking, okay, I can do this. You know, this was cool. Uh, this dude from Dallas, 10K Cash. I don't know if you know 10K. Um, yeah. I, I think he's going to crush it, man. He and I just did a song together. Um, I really see big things for him. A couple other like young and up-and-comers who I'm really into. Um, this dude, Cardi Banks from Wisconsin, who we were talking about. I think Cardi's going to do really well. Um, another young dude, Lil HBK, another Texas dude. A um, couple of these young guys I've been talking with, um, you know, work, working on sending them beats and, and trying to put some stuff together with them. I definitely love the idea of trying to find who's next. You know, there's a lot of great guys out there, and I'd love to get beats on some of these on big records, but um, finding who's next is really fun, too. I think that's part of it. So in 2019, um, I just want to flood the market, man. I want to get a bunch of songs out there, and that's why I did Beat Stars. Instead of keeping everything exclusive and keeping it to myself and, and being like, if you can't get in touch with me, you can't get a beat. I just want people to, to check out my stuff and, and use the music and just spread the name out. So I figured, be, you know, with, you know, inexpensive leases and stuff like that on Beatstars, it's a great way just to get your music out there. And, and hopefully 2019 will, uh, you know, bring a lot of songs out there with me producing them. Cool, man. Well, wishing you much continued success uh, in the production world. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your knowledge. Appreciate your experiences. No problem, man. I appreciate Beatstars, um, you know, repping for me like this too, man. And um, best of luck with everything with you too, man. You, you've, you've done a lot of really cool things, man. It's an honor to get to uh, talk with you like this too.